good morning. Hello, hello. Hey, would you guys stand with us? We're going to take some time and worship as we get started this morning. And I just want to encourage you guys today, uh, this, this week, I've been kind of thinking and praying about this. When it comes to worship, the foundation and the platform of our worship is giving God credit for what he deserves credit for. It's gratitude. It's thankfulness. And so today as we're singing and we're worshiping together, I just want to encourage you, uh, think past the, the words that are on the screen. Sing the words. Sing along and make noise with us, but, but, but let it be rooted in what you're grateful for. And so I'm just going to pray to start us off. Lord, we just, we're here for you today. We're gathering together for you. We're under your name, Jesus. And I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you'd be here with us, receive praise from us, and uh, remind us. Remind us of all the things that you've done, all the things you're doing. And just give us an awareness of those things as we worship you so that our worship is gratitude built on the foundation of who you are and what you're doing. Amen. Let's worship together. fall short I've got nothing new how could I express all my gratitude I can sing these songs as I often do but every song must end together let's sing so i throw up my hands and praise you again and again because all that i have is a hallelujah hallelujah and i know it's not much i'm nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. I've got one response. I've got just one move. With my arms stretched wide. I will worship you, oh, so I throw up my hands, praise you again and again, so that For a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. All right, all together, let's sing this. you get shy on me lift up your song cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs get up and praise the Lord oh you sing come on my soul don't you get shy on me lift up your song cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs get up and praise the Lord Come on, my soul, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song, cause you got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Oh, oh we 
together this morning. stand strong and worship you and if it puts me in the fire I rejoice cause you're there too and I won't be formed by feelings I hold fast to what is true cause if the cross brings transformation I'll be crucified with you 
Cause death is just a doorway into resurrection life, God. And if I join you in your suffering, then I join you in you rise. And when you return in glory with all the You were holy, 
sing this together. Sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lamb upon the throne. Holy, holy, holy is the Lamb upon the throne. Join with all of heaven in the everlasting. singing that together. We sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lamb upon the throne. Join with all of heaven in the everlasting song. Holy, holy, holy is the Lamb upon the throne. Join with all of heaven in the everlasting song. clap of offering. Jesus, we just love you. We thank you for all you did already and for all that is to come in the rest of this service. It was just such a sweet, sweet time of worship together in God's presence with you guys. Hey, I'm Jenica. If we haven't met yet, I'm really looking forward to meeting you. Thank you all so much for making the decision and the time and effort to be here today, and I'm excited to see what God does through this time. Uh, I wanted to let you know about two things that we would love to invite you to be part of this week. 
This Wednesday at 6.30, we start our next round of Vine group nights, which I'm pretty pumped about. And that is just such a special time for us that if you if you call the church your home or maybe you're newer to the church, this is where we really start to get to know each other more deeply. It's hard on a Sunday morning, as you know, to really connect with people in deeper conversations sometimes. There's a lot of us moving in and out. And so this gives us the chance to start to really form some relationships. And we also get to dive deep into a topic over several weeks that we kind of dig into and can really take our time with. And so it's a hugely uh, important learning opportunity as well. So we hope you're there. And if you are coming this Wednesday, please bring along a finger food. Um, youth group also happens at the same time on Wednesday nights at 630. Uh, two parents that have youth just want to make sure you knew that that was happening as well. And then this Friday at 6 p.m., we are going to have an extended time of worship together as a church family, just getting to worship our guts out to our wonderful, wonderful God. And uh, the worship band has also written a few new songs that they're going to be introducing that night as well. So it's just an awesome time. Feel free to bring your friends, friends from other churches, and we'll just gather together and give God the praise. And we're also going to have some time of um, ministry opportunity and prayer opportunity as well during that. So we want you there, and we're looking forward to it. I'm going to go ahead and welcome up. Oh, look at them. They're so good. The ushers are already up here. Welcome. <laughs> um, I'm going to pray for the tithes and offerings. This is just an opportunity for those of us that call the church, our this church, our home. We get to provide uh, tithes and offerings to Jesus as a way to recognize, Lord, we recognize that everything is yours and we are stewards of it. And so it's an extended opportunity to worship Jesus through that. So I'm going to pray for it and we're going to jump in. Jesus, we thank you so much for your presence. We thank you for what you've been doing and what you have yet to do and are going to do this morning. God, we just want to pause and recognize your place of authority in our lives. And Lord, as we bring our tithes and offerings today, we ask that you would multiply them, that the most ministry possible could happen through every dollar that comes in and you would guide us as we steward that money. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Watch this video. Good morning. Welcome to the Vine. My name is Desiree Kripe. It is my joy to ensure your time here is filled with warmth, connection, and a true sense of belonging. When you arrive, you should have received a Connect card. Filling out a Connect card is a simple way for us to get to know you better. You can drop the card in the offering plate or conveniently turn it in at the Welcome Center on your way out. I can't wait to connect with you. How can you find out about events going on at the Vine? Well, you can sign up for text updates. You can visit the website at thevinegoshen.org or you can download the Vine app. Now, if technology isn't your thing, simply stop by the Welcome Center and we have a team there that would love to get you connected and to tell you about upcoming events that are going on around the church. So don't miss out, make sure you get connected. Parents of little ones, we are so glad you're here and we want you to know that we totally get that babies make noise. So because of that, we've created a couple spaces with you in mind to serve you should your little one get fussy or restless during the service. Behind me here in the cafe, we've got a space where we stream in the service live as well as in the mother's room. In the mother's room, you'll also find a changing table and you'll find a changing table in the family bathroom. Well, good morning, everybody. Hey, my name is Jenna. I am on staff here. I'm one of our directors, and I'm just so excited I get to bring the message today. We are in a new series that we're calling Questions, and it's a series where we're seeking to tackle some of the questions that come up as being a Christian. And so today, we're going to tackle, don't worry, two really simple, easy questions. First one is, do you have an in hell exist? And second, if God is loving, how can he allow something as horrible as hell to exist? So super light and easy. If this is your first time with us today, I'm so glad you're here. I really am. This is obviously not going to be a typical message you would hear on a Sunday morning. But I am glad that you're here, and I am hopeful that something in here is going to be helpful for you. So we just welcome you, and we're so glad you're with us today. 
But what comes to your mind when I say heaven and hell, what images come to our minds? We may think about, oh, people sitting on clouds, wearing togas, and playing harps. Or maybe you're thinking about, like, a cave that's on fire, and there's these imps people, like, poking people with pitchforks. My point is, is that we're all coming to this topic with a preset filter. We all have some pre-shaped ideas of what heaven and hell look like. And so we're going to talk about heaven and hell today, but we're not going to be able to do so without climbing in and through some things that we've believed for a while. And what I'm going to present to you today is what, based on our current understanding, is most widely accepted by biblical scholars and theologians. Note that I say current understanding and most widely accepted because there is just so much we don't know, and this could change. There are people who spend their entire lives studying this topic, and they still have questions. And so we, we just can't fit everything that needs said into 25 minutes. And so if something feels like it's missing, if it doesn't sit with you well, if you disagree, that is totally okay. Know that what I'm trying to do today is just to simply give you some, some ideas, backed by research, to help grapple with a hard topic. And I'm just seeking to be as informative as I can. And specifically, if you're my brothers and sisters, you grew up in the church, I want to talk to you real quick for a moment. I'm going to say some things today that will disturb you. Please know that I'm saying them as humbly and as kindly as I can because I absolutely could be wrong. But know that I am saying them intentionally with the purpose to disturb you. I want to disturb you. And I want to disturb you because freshly disturbed soil, that's where new things get planted. And so whether you've been in church for a while or whether you are brand new to this, I just want to invite you to come and sit with me in some discomfort. And my prayer is that if you're willing to sit with me there, I'm praying that God's going to honor that and plant something new for us today. So know that I'm approaching this not lightly. I've tried to do the best I can with the material and the understanding we have. But if you disagree, 100% okay. I'm just seeking to be as informative as I can. Fair enough? Great. Well, let's dive in. So heaven and hell, are they real places? Yes. Great. Let's go home. Message over. <laughs> no, seriously. Heaven and hell, absolutely. They are real places, but they're also more than just real places. And we're going to talk about that in a second. But they are places that they're at the very limit of our ability to describe and explain with human language. And so the biblical authors, they use a lot of images to try to help us understand what these places are going to be like. And so specifically looking at hell, this is how biblical authors are kind of describing it. They are saying that it is going to be a place of darkness, death, the grave, and fire. So much fun. So darkness, this is an important image. Because darkness is most often connected with remorse. Those two things are linked very closely. And the most common word that gets translated as hell in the Bible is this word called Sheol. Or in the Greek, we get the word Hades. So Sheol and Hades, they're the same thing. They just mean the grave. That's it. And we get this word a lot in the Psalms. And so we have Psalms like Psalms 139.8. It says, if I ascend to the heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. And we have Psalms 116.3. It says, death wrapped its ropes around me. The terrors of the grave, that Sheol, overtook me. I saw only trouble and sorrow. So we get this idea right away that Sheol, so the grave, is a place that is still under God's control. He's an absent from the grave. But there is something about the grave that is separating. It separates us from God. And when we're separated from God, we are separated from light and life and love. And so this is important because it means that 
hell is going to be a very empty place filled with remorse. The other second image we get pretty commonly is the idea of fire. We often get, you know, descriptions of lakes or rivers of fire. And another word that gets linked pretty closely with this image of fire is this word Gehenna. We're going to spend time on Gehenna a little bit deeper later on because, and here's really interesting, Gehenna is almost exclusively used by Jesus. And so that's pretty significant. We're going to dive into that. But fire is an important image because, yes, fire is destructive. It's eliminating. But it's also transforming and purifying. And so there are people that believe that these descriptions of darkness and fire, that these are literal descriptions of hell. And if that's you, totally okay. Myself and some other scholars, we tend to think that this is metaphor, that the Bible is trying to help us understand something that's going to be both familiar and completely unfamiliar. And so if you prefer to think of this as literal imagery, again, completely okay. My only encouragement would be that to really grasp hold of the importance of the imagery Because whatever hell ends up being like, it's going to have these characteristics. It is going to be a place of eliminating separation that transforms and purifies the world. And it's going to be a very empty place full of remorse. That's it. That's all the Bible is really saying about hell, at least describing hell. But I also mentioned that the Bible is also really interested in showing us that hell is not just a future reality, it's a present one. So what do I mean by that? Well, what's interesting is that in the Bible, both the good and the wicked, both are destined for death in the grave. Um, Jenna, aren't Christians supposed to go to heaven? We're going to get there. Hang with me. But in the Bible, when it talks about Sheol, so the grave side of hell, we're all destined for it. And we don't have time to preach through Genesis today. Everybody knows it's my favorite. But here's what I will tell you about Genesis. It is a beautiful poem where we see God create this wonderful world, and he gives it to us to rule and to steward. And then we're given a choice. And this choice is represented as a fruit that we have the decision to either eat or not eat. Hear me very clearly when I say that this fruit is not a trick or a trap placed in the garden to catch us. It's an opportunity to trust God. Because see, this fruit is described as the knowledge of good and evil. And up until this point... We trusted God. We trusted that God was a good God. And so what a good God says is good must be good. However, we decided we didn't want to trust God. We wanted to be gods. And we decided to take for ourselves this fruit and start deciding for ourselves what is good and what is evil. And if we look at the course of human history, what we'll find is we make really bad gods. Let's keep our day jobs. When we chose to decide for ourselves what is good and what is evil, we introduced death into the world. Death was not an original part of God's creation. Death is an enemy and an invader in God's world. And death, while it's linked with this funny little word we find all over the Bible called sin. Sin is not just a moral failure or doing what I know I shouldn't do. Sin is that lovely little whisper that loves to tell us that what we're doing is okay. Sin is when I choose to decide if what I'm doing is good or bad to suit my own desires. 
sin, hell, it's not just a future reality. It's a present one. We want hell. We choose hell. We choose it every time we choose pride or selfishness or taking advantage. And worse, we choose those things and then convince ourselves that we're doing it for a good reason. Well, I needed it more than they do. You know, they wouldn't have appreciated it anyway. Don't they know that I deserve this? Don't they see how busy I am, how important I am, how much better I would be at this than that other person? You know, if they really cared about me, they would fill in the blank. (laughs) You know, if I'm really honest with myself, the most convincing liar in my life is me. Hell isn't just a future reality, it's a present one. And how can we save ourselves? We can't. It's like quicksand. The faster you move around, the faster you sink. And the desperate cry of the Bible is that God would save us. We hear it all over the Psalms. What could save me? What could possibly save me? What ransom could ever be enough? I cannot save myself. But surely, surely God can. Surely God will. Surely God will redeem my life. He will snatch me from the power of the grave. You will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. I can't save my life. But surely God can. And we're told that God has through Jesus. See, Jesus comes onto the scene, and he makes this really bizarre claim. He claims that somehow through his physical, present body, that he is the source of life. And he doesn't just claim this, he proves it. Wherever he goes, death cannot exist. Life appears, relationships are restored. This guy can't go to a funeral with somebody coming up from the dead. See, just like death is a present reality in our world, life, eternal life, heaven, it also becomes a present reality through Jesus. Heaven is not just something that we're only going to experience in the far off future. Heaven is something we get to experience right now in our physical presence when we accept Jesus into our life and begin to walk in relationship with him. Relationships are restored. People are healed. Peace and joy replace violence and depression. That is the power of heaven at work in our world right now. Amen? Amen. That's heaven and hell. They are places we will go, but they are also things we experience in our world right now. But they are real places. And the Bible tells us there are places we will go to. And so what does that look like? Because, see, a large part of the Christian hope is hung up on this moment where heaven and hell are going to become eternal realities. And this moment is often described as a day of judgment. We struggle with passages about God's judgment Because they appear to be full of violence and wrath. And we're prone to just think that God's just wrecking everything because he's mad. What I want to do today is to challenge us to rethink the way that we're thinking about hell and about judgment. And to start thinking about these things as actually proof of God's love for us. I mentioned earlier that Jesus often uses this word Gehenna when he talks about hell. So we have a picture of Gehenna. I believe you can put it up if you can. It's a real place. You can visit it today. There it is. Doesn't that look nice? I take a vacation there. It looks wonderful. But see, Gehenna has a really long history. 
In 2 Chronicles, it tells us that the kings of Israel, they built altars to pagan gods in this valley, and they began human sacrifices. This was normally children, even sacrificing their own sons. And God confronts them. He confronts them in Jeremiah 19, and this is what he tells them. This is what he tells them. He says, you're going to be handed over to an enemy nation. Your bodies are going to be ripped apart by wild animals and birds. Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. You're going to run out of food and resort to cannibalism. Yeesh. God, would you please eat us Snickers? And God is just screaming, stop sacrificing children. Who here is 24 years or older? Come on, raise your hands. I know I'm making you own up to your age. 24 years or older. Okay, if you're 24 years or older, you were born in the 20th century. The 20th century, to, so far, is the bloodiest century in human history. More humans have died to the hands of other humans in the 20th century than any other century so far. My sincere and honest prayer for myself and for every single person in this room is that we never become so callous to human violence that that doesn't piss us off. There is something deeply wrong with us if we are not ticked by the state of the world. And there would be something deeply wrong with God if he is not ticked about what we've been doing to one another. See, judgment, it is good news. It really is because it means there is hope for the world. There is accountability for our actions. There is justice for the cruelty and violence and evil that we see running rampant in this world. God is not and will not ignore pain and suffering. If you're struggling with this, it's okay. I am struggling with this. Because we don't mind justice. Justice is great. It's just that there's something about hell that feels like more than being held accountable. Ultimately, the problem most of us have with hell is that if God is kind, if God is loving, how can something as brutal as hell be allowed to exist? And I would again encourage us to redefine the way that we're thinking about hell and to see it as proof of God's love. This is another area that I would like to lovingly but humbly disturb some soil. If you've been in church for a while, you might wrestle with this, but scholars, and I could be wrong, but scholars are thinking that we really shouldn't think about hell as a place where we're going to be handed over to Satan and suffer in fire and brimstone. There is a spiritual element to this. We do not have time to get into it today. But what I would propose is that it is more accurate to think about hell as being handed over to exactly what I want. Hell is a place where we will be given over fully to our selfish desires. Hell is a place where, remember fire, fire it is eliminating separation. So we will be completely separated from God and from one another. And so imagine a place full of people who cannot love and trust one another. Imagine a place where everybody is so concerned with their own well-being, even if that well-being is at the cost of someone else. Imagine a place, imagine walking out of those doors and never experiencing love or belonging ever again. That's hell. 
And so my belief is that hell is going to be horrible, not because God is wanting to actively make people suffer, but because of the nature of what hell is. And how do we wrestle with this? How do we wrestle with seeing something like that as proof of God's love for us? And the reality is, is because for love to exist, true love, there must be a possibility of rejection. That is why love, it cannot exist in any sort of a forced relationship. That's why it cannot exist in abuse. Imagine, <laughs> imagine there's somebody who loves someone else, but that someone does not love them back. They're like, oh, no big deal. I'm just going to continue to follow along with them and just keep showing them how much I love and appreciate them. Okay, that's not love. That's a stalker. <laughs> no one is going to be forced to live in eternity with God forever. Nobody is going to be forced. It is a choice. It is a choice to be in close relationship with God. Tim Mackey, he's the, one of the founders of the Bible Project, and I think he puts this very aptly. He says it this way. Close relationship with God is terrifying because we have to bring all the mess-up shame and ugliness to the table and let it be exposed. And then we have to humble ourselves and deal with it. And for some people, to be in God's presence that closely and have all of who they are exposed to God in relationship, for some people that would be hell because they have turned so inwards on themselves. He says later, hell is a part of God's love because true love is one that allows the other to decide. And if the other decides to reject love, does that mean that love doesn't exist? No. It does everything it can to convince and persuade. But if in the end they don't want it, that possibility has to exist. God loves us. He wants relationship with us. God does not desire that anyone ends up separated from him. Hell is not a trick or some surprise at the end of a game. Hell is a choice. Love and close relationship with God, it is a choice. And if we decide that we would rather live without him, he's going to respect our decision. I don't think any of us want to end on hell. So how about we talk about heaven, yeah? <laughs> Amen for that. When the biblical authors talk about heaven, it's always plural. It's heavens. And they're doing this for a reason because in their understanding, heavens, there's different layers of heaven. So first heaven is the sky, the clouds, the birds. Second heaven is what's beyond that. So planets, stars, all of that. And then somewhere beyond that, that's third heaven, that's God's space. And so that's why sometimes you get these confusing passages that say something like, I was caught up to the third heavens. What they're saying is, I was in God's space. I was in his presence. And so biblical scholars are kind of tracking with this idea in the Bible that heaven is God's space and earth, that's our space. And now normally these two things can't overlap, but we're told they did in the garden. The Garden of Eden at the very beginning of the Bible, that was a space where God and us could come together completely in full relationship with one another. And so what we think we can see is that we can track this theme through the Bible that God's intention is to bring heaven and earth together once again. And so this is something I want to challenge us on as well. If you have been in church for a while, it's probably going to take you some time to wrestle with this. You are completely welcome to disagree. Know that I'm just presenting this as humbly as I can, knowing I could be wrong. But what we would like to propose is to start thinking about and talking about heaven 
as describing it as new creation. Because the thing is that heaven is kind of associated with God's space. And so we've created in our heads this image of this disembodied spiritual paradise. But when the biblical authors are talking about heaven, they're often talking about it as a physical place. We get a lot of descriptions about gardens, about trees and rivers. And Jesus, he says in Luke 23, he's hanging on the cross, taking all of the death on himself. And there's two criminals that are hung beside him. One scoffs him, the other one accepts him. And to the one ex who accepts him, he says this very interesting phrase. He says, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. Paradise doesn't have penalty. This is a Greek word, paradiso, and it just means garden. Jesus is saying we will be with him in the garden. And he's saying that because he's making the reference to Genesis because that was where we could be fully in God's presence. And so what he's saying is you will be with me in God's presence. So it is not at all inaccurate to say we go to heaven when we die. Not at all. Is this everything we need to know? No. Is it a powerful word of hope for those facing death? Absolutely. But what we are challenging is that new creation is a really accurate way to see what God is trying to do because God wants to call us back to the garden. The Bible ends the same way it begins. It describes a new, in Revelations a new heaven and a new earth coming together again in a new creation. It is a call back to the garden where heaven and earth completely overlap and we are restored in relationship fully both with God and with one another. That's beautiful. And we get some descriptions of what new creation is going to be like. We're told that new creation is going to be like a garden and like a city. And so it's like a city because cities are these places where there's innovation, creativity, industry, inspiration, invention. And gardens, they are places of peace, rest, beauty. And so the Bible is telling us that new creation is going to be both. We're told that we'll have a job in new creation. We will be restored to our original purpose, which is to be fruitful and to steward. And so that means we're going to go places. We're going to do stuff. We're going to make things, video games, art, fashion, music, baking, gardening. We're told it is going to be for all people. And so it's going to be multinational, multi-ethnic, multicultural. Imagine... All of the best stuff that humanity and the world has to offer. Music, art, movies, beaches, mountains, tacos. <laughs> it's going to be all the good, best things. And it will also be a place where we are restored fully in relationship to one another and to God, it will be a place of true and perfect love and belonging. We will have complete openness and vulnerability with one another without fear of rejection. I'm going to invite the worship team back up. I know that today was probably not the message that you were expecting to walk in and hear. So I just want to thank you for coming with me on this journey. And I just want to say, if you're wrestling with this, because I know this was a lot of information, this was a lot of difficult concepts, I want you to know it's okay. And if you walk out of here completely disagreeing with everything I said, totally cool, I get it. But if you walk away with nothing else, I hope you walk away with this. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only son. And the judgment is based on this 
fact. God's light came into the world, but people loved darkness more than light, for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right come to the light so others can see they are doing what God wants. We're going to go into a time of just ministry and worship today. And I just want to invite you. Being in relationship with God is a choice. He wants it. He craves it. He's desperate for it. And so I want to call two people. If you've never surrendered your life to God, I want to invite you to have the opportunity to do so today. We're going to have people up at the front with lanyards on. They would love to pray with you as you make that decision. The second group is if you're here and you feel like, I do believe in God, but it just feels like something's been getting in the way. I don't feel like I have life. I want to invite you to respond to that today and just have somebody pray with you because these people here, they are, they are here because they love you and they want to partner in prayer with you. And so we want to invite you to do that. Our prayer team, they get together for pre-service prayer and we have some things on the screens. Maybe you're not one of the two people, but there might be something up here that you're like, oh, that's me. Come and receive prayer today. Don't leave without getting prayer for something that you need. It is so, so powerful. And so we just want to invite you and as we go into this next song, just respond as we feel called. Pray and we'll go into worship. So God, we just thank you. We thank you that you are a good God, that you are a God who loves us. You are a God who desires us. You want relationship with us. And we thank you that you do not ignore the pain and the suffering in our lives, but that you deeply, deeply and passionately care about us. And so, God, we thank you that you are a big God and that no matter where we sit with all of this stuff, that you are big enough to take care of it. And so we seal that with a thank you and an I love you. We love you, God. In your name, amen. got nothing in how could I express all my gratitude I can sing these songs as I often do but every song must end throw up my hands and praise you again and again so that this morning we sing so I throw up my hands I praise you again and again cause all that I have is a
together. Lord, we throw up our hands and praise you again and again. Because all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much. I'm nothing else fit for for a heart singing hallelujah hallelujah all right guys well hey we're gonna go ahead and dismiss our time together today um just a couple reminders uh, but if you're here today and there's something that is up on this list that, that Jenna brought up earlier. Or maybe there's something that, as she was talking, just about God's love kind of stuck out to me. God's love for us that you want prayer for. We'd love to pray with you. Don't leave today without receiving prayer if that's you. We would love to pray with you and uh, talk with you. But other than that, we're going to dismiss. So we'll see you guys next week. Love you all.